Okay, thank you very much. Um, I, by the way, I really have enjoyed this weekend and being here, but I'll say something more a little bit later. Um, I want to start with this image on the screen between, because between 1909 and 1914, in what can only be described as a radical experiment, the new garden city of Hellerau was built on the outskirts of Dresden. Uh, the view of the, uh, the town in, excel, uh, in its planning and conception was, it was exceptional for several reasons, one of which the architectural environment was carefully considered. Several planning principles were implemented, such as wildlife habitats, individual flower and vegetable gardens, uh, standards of natural lighting and ventilation, and even such new things as indoor laundries and toilets. But what was really, or truly radical, was the intention behind the town. One of its co-founders, Wolf Dorn, he was a young statistician who had just finished his doctoral studies in Munich under the famed psychologist of empathy theory, Theodor Lips. Dorn wanted to build a community based on the latest psychological and physiological knowledge, and to this end, he invited this person to relocate his academy to Hellerau. Emile Jacques Dalcroze, a Swiss musicologist and professor at Harmony who had come to fame by implementing a curriculum that he called rhythmic gymnastics or eurythmics. That is a series of rhythmic and musical exercises worked into regular air and sun baths. Dalcroze had devised a program that attempted to harmonize the body with the neurological rhythms of the brain. In his words, and I'm quoting, to bring about a coordination between the mind which conceives, the brain which alter orders, the nerve which transmits, and the muscle which executes. And the key to this objective, objective was tapping into the body's natural rhythms. As he noted further, for the body can be a marvelous instrument of beauty and harmony when it vibrates in tune with artistic imagination and collaborates with creative thought. To cut, a long, well, to cut a long story short, I guess I'm behind here. Dalcroze's program was wildly successful as Hellerau overnight became a sensation across Germany. Musically, it was a rival to Bayreuth. The two-week music festival of 1913 alone attracted 5,000 visitors as virtually every German intellectual and a good number of well-known foreigners visited the town in its first few years. Among them, Ebenezer Howard, Martin Buber, George Bernard Shaw, Franz Kafka, Igor Stravinsky, Thomas Mann, Oscar Kokoska, Heinrich Wolfland, Wilhelm Voringer, Upton Sinclair, Ada Brunn, who was engaged to Mies van der Rohe, and Alma Mailer, who would soon marry Walter Gropius. Among the architects who visited the town were Henry van der Velde, Peter Behrens, Mies van der Rohe, and Le Corbusier, who in fact visited the town on no less than four occasions. His brother was in fact employed by, by Dal Crows as, as a musicologist. One early enthusiast of Hellerau, M.T.H. Sadler, likened Dal Crows's experimental programs to the beautiful abstractions of color and line that were contemporaneously being explored by Kandinsky. Another credited Dal Crows with opening the door that had long been closed, the rediscovery of one of the secrets of Greek education. To put this experiment of, at Hellerau in contemporary terms, what Dorn and Del Croze were attempting was to implement the idea of environmental enrichment wrapped within a larger theory of embodiment. The belief that we want to have, if we want to have harmonious social relations, not only should the various sensory modalities be happily integrated with each other and with the action areas of our sensory motor cortex for each environmental event, but also that a successful environment will ultimately enhance human learning and happiness. In philosophical terms today, we might liken it to the inactive model of radical embodiment proposed by Francisco, Francisco Varilla and Evan Thompson operating within three dimensions, the organismic or homeostatic regulation of the body the sensory motor, sensory motor coupling of the organism with the, with the environment, that is how an organism moves and engages the environmental field, 
And thirdly, the interactions with other people made possible by mirror neurons, but embedded within a larger cultural context. As Evan Thompson notes, the knowing and feeling subject is not the brain in the head or even the body plus the brain, but the socially and culturally situated person who is enfolded within a larger environmental field that, is at the, at, that at the same time shapes the cognitive structure of the developmental systems. Such a model is important to architecture, and, uh, and of course we've heard precisely these sentiments uh, conveyed on numerous occasions of the last few days. It, they are important to, to architecture not only for the obvious reason that the architect designs the built environment, but also it stresses that architectural, architecture is a place of social interchange through which we, in so many ways, define our existence. Now, there are two aspects to, to, the, uh, uh, to the neuroscientific research of the past few decades that I want to address, address very briefly in this regard. One is our new understanding of emotion, and the second is a resurgence of, a, of an old theory of empathy. I intend the, the term emotion in the biological sense of the process by which the brain can determines or computes the value of a stimulus, and I would like to limit myself to the preconscious aspect of our emotional experience, which of course stands in opposition to the overly conceptualized focus of architectural theory over the past half century, in which emotion has almost been entirely removed from architectural consideration. In fact, since 1970, it's almost been, it's, it's, it's really a half century of removal. So let's take these two buildings in Berlin, Mies van der Rohe's National Gallery and Hans Scharoun's Philharmonic Hall. Both were completed in the 1960s and both were built by friends who in their youth had similar views or visions of modernism. And my question is, given their similar training and interest, and contemporaneity, why were these two approaches so different? And how do we respond to them emotionally as environmental fields? Mises' work consists of eight perimeter columns supporting a colossal box truss overhanging four walls of glass. It disallows any suggestion of spatial enclosure or scale. It is an exercise in tectonic logic and structural rigor Whereas Sharon's Philharmonic Hall, by contrast, is almost defiant as a, as a formal exercise, and it is notable for its colorful exterior textures and compositional play of forms that, in fact, has no front or rear facade. The differences are particularly acute inside the two buildings. Mises is, of course, fully, the building is fully transparent. In Sharon's Hall, concert goers sit on canted platforms and terraces under a parabolic ceiling from which acoustic panels are arrayed like free-floating clouds below a starry firmament. Seating platforms are highly differentiated, yet the building is experienced spatially as if one is sitting inside a colossal tent. 25 years ago, if one were to raise the question of why these approaches are so different, the answer would simply be that the two architects had different personalities. Fifteen years ago, if one were to pose the same question, might, one might have responded that these, were, these two men were obviously left and right brain designers. What we now know about the brain, however, with what we now know, we, neither answer suffices, suffices today, and perhaps we will never know why these two men, who were stylistic similar in their youth, diverged so sharply in their, in their later years. But what about the second question? How are these two buildings experienced? And uh, again, I've, this is very interesting in, in, in with the discussion of the speaker uh, that, that uh, um, two speakers that, that preceded me. The neuroscientist Bud, Bud Craig, who's at Arizona State University, has offered uh, uh, some, some pointers in this regard, for he points out that the functioning of the insular cortex in both hemispheres follows the wiring of the autonomic nervous system, that is, the sympathic and parasympathic circuits, the neural subsystems by which, are, which control our bodily functions by working in a reciprocal manner. Craig argues that the activity of these two insulas follows upon these asymmetries with the result that the right insula becomes more active with energy expenditure, arousal, and stimulative effects while the left insula is associated with energy nourishment and relaxation. 
in architectural terms, then the, arous the arousing situations are environments expending physical and mental energy would activate more of the right insula, whereas situations and environments of physical and mental relaxation would become manifest predominantly in the left insula. And all in architectural environments, which is really the point of this, really s seem to work between these two emotional poles. Miesian architecture, notwithstanding its lack of enclosure, is seemingly parasympathic. His structure and proportions are regular and linear. The materials of steel and glass are cool to the touch. And not surprisingly, his industrial structures are often, in fact, described as being cool, even cerebral. Sharon's Philharmonic Hall, by contrast, is arousing in every sense of the term. The design is a multi-sensory production with colorful, with a colorful orchestration of materials, textures, and forms. It is a highly enriched environment that demands little in the way of conceptual understanding or analysis, but rather elicits a strong emotional re response that seems quite appropriate to an enclosure that houses the intensely emotional art of music. The spatial atmosphere of the concert hall can even be experienced as an allegory to tribal rituals and affiliative events as one minds, one's mind becomes hyperactive in this vast musical space. Almost any communal space can be experienced as hyperactive and affiliative, uh, whereas, well, I'm not there. Um, the Prisker Pavilion in Grant Park in Chicago, whereas a Zen monastery, for example, is intrinsically a place of withdrawal and retreat. Some environments can be both at the same time. The spectacular mosaic effects of an Islamic mosque located along a caravan route within a barren desert landscape might be a welcome place of perceptual recollection and healing a conscious act of sensory stimulation to repair the jaded effects of sensory deprivation. And this leads me to the notion of Einfühlung, which is often translated as empathy, although it is uh, in German uh, is simply feeling into. And it is a concept that was first introduced by Robert Fisher in 1873, based on the premise that we neurologically stimu simulate our aspects of our physical environment during our perceptual activity. In his words, every mental act is brought about and at the same time reflected in certain inner vibrations and who knows what neural modifications that take place within the organism. He further described Einfühlung as an emotional projection of ourselves, one that circumscribes our organismic relation with the world and art for, for Fisher was defined as a general strengthening or weakening of our vital sensations. And the strengthening capacity, what he termed an intensification of sensuousness. The art historian Heinrich Wolflin in 1886 followed Fisher with one small qualification. He dismissed the idea of a projection of the ego and he countered with the argument that we animate architectural forms simply because we ourselves possess a body. The optic nerve directly simulates the motor nerves and thereby works in sympathy with our internal organs. The psychologist Theodore Lieps, under whom Dorn studied uh, in Leipzig, advanced the concept of empathy further. He noted that we animate architectural lines and forms with movements. We humanize natural objects and project our feelings into colors. We read the gestures of another person or even a building as an expression of, of their thoughts or someone's idea. Architecture for Leap says, well, is a somatic and visceral experience everywhere we see unified masses advancing and receding and we transform these masses into a living rhythm of tension and relaxation as Cortona did with this facade of Santa Maria della Pace. Now, what I find interesting in light of the research today is that at the beginning of the 20th century, there were even attempts to quantify the idea of, sci of Einfühlung scientifically. In Florence, for example, Vernon Lee and Clement uh, uh, Clementina and Struder Thompson constructed elaborate devices to measure the human physiological responses to architecture. 
and this is their example in standing before the Church of Santa Maria Novella in Florence, they noted that the facade keeps the thorax from collapsing as much as usual during the act of expiration. One's respiration seems to find an accord with the proportions of the building. The overall reading of the facade for forces a certain pressure on the feet, a downward pressure on the head, both of which are offset by the spring lines of the arches. Such studies are important today, as we know, because mirror neurons, mirror neurons are active during the perceptual construction of our inanimate environment. That is, we seem to simulate the materials, forms, sounds, tactile qualities, textures, colors, and general ambience of our architectural surroundings. David Freeberg and Victoria Galezi, who prefer the term embodied simulation over empathy, take the idea one step further. They define it as the precognitive activation of embodied mechanisms encompassing the simulation of actions, emotions, and corporal sensations which include not only the material aspects of the physical environment, but also the artist's creative gestures, such as the, as the vigorous modeling in clay, uh, the, the paintings of Pollock, uh, the fast brushwork, signs of movements more generally, which again we transpose within our premotor cortex or simulate within our premotor cortex. If this is true, as I think we've always known, then we emotionally simulate the delicate force of a sculptor's chisel in this Assyrian bas-relief. But we also simulate the pride of a powerful culture that was put on display. In the Church of St. Peter's, the twisted columns of Bernini's Baldacchino strikes a pleasing note of tension as we visually engage it in a visceral act of simulation again on a pre-reflective level. Uh, because the architectural experience is embodied, we, of course, as, as we've seen already, bathe in the polychromatic splendor of a Gothic cathedral, but we also inhale the incense and the fungus that has worked its way into the porous stonework, and we measure the spatial expanse of a cathedral by the reverberation level. And in this church of Heinz Tesar, we read light in an animate and existential way as fleeting patterns of time shifting across the room minute by minute. All of this, I think, points to what is really the, I, what I find the success of the conference, because I, I have no doubt that the scientific research that we have seen this past week, weekend will lead to a more satisfying material and spatial environments. But it also does something which I find very interesting in my perspective, which is one of theory, and, and that is the fact that, as I say, for a half a century, we have been focused on building as buildings as objects, the over-conceptualization of what something means or signifies in a symbiotic or other sense. I think it's time that we return our focus back to the design of the human individual and I think an empathetic understanding of embodied simulation will also engage our cultural instincts for such things as novelty, curiosity, and play, dimensions that similarly enhance our vitality and dignify our existence. Thank you. I appreciate the, the call for back to the body and back to uh, emotions. Um, I'm just thinking, for instance, the phenomenology as, a, as something that kind of have continued struggling, uh, especially 80s and 90s. I think it's coming back. Uh, thinking of, of Heidegger and thinking of uh, Malou Ponty and, and plasma. Other. Yeah, and so I'm, I'm, I really appreciate it that you are challenging us to to reconsider, and in that sense, I think neuroscience could really, and science could play a, a great role in supporting this, this call. Thank you. So, did, did you answer the question of why the Mises building and the Philharmonic <laughs> Hall were different? Because <laughs> I still am wondering. 
I, I actually have been talking about that with a number of architects over the, over the past two years. And, and uh, uh, Do you have no, I, I think I think obviously I think uh, you know our, our, we we design our brains in ways uh, as architects, uh, and and we we choose a certain direction and we pursue it, and and, and others will choose another direction. But I but it is interesting when you think of. Uh, you look at someone like Sharon and you look at someone like Gary, they're actually quite probably very similar in the way, although Sharon may have sketched more than worked with cardboard, but uh, they, they really sort of form a building, they compose a building, and, um, um, and, and, and I, I have to have the kind of the misfortune of living and working in a museum building. Uh, and it is, it is rigorous, but it doesn't have any sort of sensitivity to the individual that, that lives there from the, from the door handles to the fact that you step outside of Crown Hall and you, the rain hits you in the face before you can get an umbrella up and things like that. So, so it is, uh, I mean, obviously they were concerned with very different things and a very different era and very, very different uh, ideals. Thank you very much. Okay.